and Charlie class. We're very fortunate to have a very special guest in an organization that has done wonders in our area, particularly in the Santa Cruz area. It's Save Our Shores. Save Our Shores is an older organization in the environmental world. With us is Laura Casa, Executive Director of Save Our Shores. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. It's so nice to be Good here. Good to have you here. Thank I want to start you. and learn about the organization. Sure. Uh, when I said it's an older organization, what are we talking about? Over 30 years. We're 34 years old this 34 year. 34 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I imagine there are a few that, that are that old. I think Save Our Bay might be. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's still a relatively new world. Is this true? I think so. We're, we're finding that it sort of shifts from what, what is the threat to the ocean today as, as compared to what it was when we first started. So it, it always feels like there's something new coming about that we need to tackle. Well, there certainly is something new. What is your keynote? What's your key your, your, to everything? Our key is really spreading the awareness about what the ocean is facing as far as threats go. And then our mission is really to take those folks that are then educated and bring them into some kind of community action and really make a difference for the ocean. Hence, we, we can go. Now, the automatic thing that I would think of is something that uh, is certainly well known, clean up. Clean up at the beach, uh, clean up in different areas and so forth. Right. But since I've been talking with you and I learned there's a lot more to the organization, we'll get into that in a minute. But I, I'd like to touch on just a couple of the other things and we'll go back and talk later. Sure. Now, you had said something before the show that it didn't start with cleanup. What right. did it start with? Well, we organized as a very small group of citizens in Santa Cruz County simply to fight offshore oil drilling because the folks that lived in Santa Cruz did not want to see the offshore oil rigs that were seen in Southern California. And there were some recent spills in Southern California that we just didn't want to have that be in our future. So well, the spills never happened because it, 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 they didn't drill. How was this put, orchestrated? How did it? Uh, so, so it, it came about by the first executive director was Dan Hayfley, and he was a one-man show. He really just tried to get the, the community involved and support and get petitions signed in order to make sure that there was no way that, that they could drill off our coast. And what happened was they advocated for a marine sanctuary. And now we do have the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which means they'll never be able to drill there for so oil. So this was the way to prevent the oil rate. Exactly. Oh, wonderful. Exactly. But then we needed the sanctuary anyway. Yes. Well, we have such a wonderful ecosystem here. We have species that are that are so rare and endangered, and we really wanted to protect that. Now, is the, is the Great Museum uh, Aquarium part of this whole organization? Well, the aquarium... We certainly partner with the aquarium. The aquarium is, has this magical feel to it. it. It draws people from around the world. I mean, there's millions of visitors every year. And so that's a lot of people's first touch to the ocean. They come and they really learn a lot about the ocean. And then what we try to do is get people to come out, as you were mentioning, and, and get involved. Like, come out and do a beach cleanup with us. Come out and actually be a part of the solution to some of these threats to the ocean. You know what I'd like to do? What's I'd like that? to go to the beach. I'd love to go to the beach, All right, too. So why don't we do this right now, and we'll, we'll, we'll get the, the beach world involved here. Uh, so as, as we're getting set for that, does this create something in a person's consciousness once they have been to the beach and done a cleanup? Absolutely, Charlie. What happens is when you get out there and you start picking up the trash and, and really seeing what's there, I think something changes with you. I think you realize, wow, this is really a problem. And so automatically from that point forward, they go to th bury something in the sand, and they don't. Oh, they don't. Pretty much our volunteers. <laughs> and they're, what happens is they end up picking up other people's tr trash every time they go to the beach then. That's right. And we're, we're, we're talking uh, something that's so great. Uh, here's, here's a group of people. Looks like they've done a big job here. Oh, yeah. That's one of our river cleanups where we happen to find more of the trash rather than just at the beach. The inland cleanups are really are really rather large. This one here, 2,300 pounds. 2,300 pounds of trash. And this is trash. just a couple of hours, usually, these cleanups are you know, anywhere from two to three hours. And these are some folks at the beach. See, their bags are a little bit smaller. They don't have quite, quite as many uh, trash items that they've mm -hmm. collected. Although I'm sure there's a lot of cigarette butts in there. Wow, now look at this. Now this is one of our uh, less maintained beaches, one of our north coast beaches where there's not a lot of enforcement up there, there's not a lot of trash cans, and so we generally do pick up a lot more trash at these locations. It looks like you do here, yes. Yeah, they had quite a job that day. That's amazing. Well, what's this little 
What's she doing So this here? little girl is sort of deciphering what she's collected because we do keep track of everything that we've picked up. So we use data cards and we mark it down. And what did she find? Plastic, plastic, some other stuff, and more plastic. And more so 72% right? of what we pick up is comprised of plastic. 72%. Well, we've got a statistical slide uh, that what, I'd like to take a look at that also. Sure. Uh, this will give us some ratio of, of uh, how much that we, you actually have picked up. Now, here we go. Why don't you explain the slide? Sure. This, what this is showing is the comparison to how much trash we're picking up when we do a beach cleanup as opposed to doing an inland cleanup. That might be at a creek or a river or a slough. So the blue line is reflective of that inland cleanup. And you can see these bars are upwards of 300 or 400 pounds of trash per cleanup. Whereas wow. for the beaches, it's less than 100 generally. You're finding smaller pieces, more lightweight pieces that are on our okay. beaches. And this is significant because everything that's in the rivers is flowing down to the ocean anyway. These could be shopping carts. These could be mattresses. We found just about everything wow. in the rivers, generally because it's, a, it's an area a lot of people aren't going to. So some people tend to dump trash there, and then it's not found maybe for many years. And our, and our volunteers are finding it they're and you're, hauling you're, out. You're finding things that are rotting and so forth. Sure. Of course, if they totally disintegrate, that would be good, but they don't. Very few things are actually going to disintegrate. If it's paper material, it will, but, but others most likely not. So, okay, I want to go back to the consciousness of, of people. Uh, I, I check myself out, too. What do I do? With the, have I always been a good person? Oh, I don't know, relatively so. I always put my things away at home and so forth. And, you know, I think some of that background, how you were brought up, how mm -hmm. you were raised, plays a significant part of where you throw trash. Mm -hmm. I believe that, and I think that's what we struggle with is, how do we educate everybody that comes to the beach or who happens to be along a river? How do we reach all of those people? We're a small organization, yet we try to use media, we try to use our website, we try to be out at community events to really communicate to people that, you know, it's, it's what you leave behind. There's not someone coming after you cleaning that up necessarily. I mean, we might get out there next month on a cleanup, but it's really about packing your own trash and looking out for other trash items and, and being responsible. What I want to do is talk about a video that we're going to be watching in a minute or so. I was fascinated. This is a video of Aptus Creek. Yep. And what it took to clean up Aptus Creek is on camera. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and watch the video so we'll get rolling here. Sounds good. Uh, it's really a, an exciting situation. I, here we go. Okay, here's a rock climbing wall. Right, so you wonder, what does this rock climbing wall have to do with our cleanup of the creek? Well... This was such a tricky area to get to that it really had probably never been cleaned up before, but we could see that there was a lot of trash underneath this trestle bridge. And so we worked with the, the local climbing gym to bring out some skilled climbers and train other folks to be able to rappel down here and pick up this trash. Now you're probably wondering, okay, well they got down there, they found all this trash, and then how did they get it back up to where our dump truck <laughs> was? And they were very creative in, in how they developed this pulley system. So instead of uh, repelling a person, now we have to lift up these well, here the boxes and bags and so forth. So here's one of the tools they used. They, they lowered these buckets down, and they lowered ropes. Do you and see what's going up? A shopping cart. Yep, and that wasn't the only one, for sure. Wow. Amazing. Almost anything you can imagine we found down here. Like I Look said. Look at the fan. Yep. I yep. think there's a, well, there's a fan coming up, I believe. It's just unbelievable. That's well, a fender of a car. A fender of a car, right. But you wonder there's how, a fan. There's that yeah. fan. You wonder how some of these things got People down there. People just throw things over, you know, no regard for uh, the, the, the impact. I must say this was the first time we did a cleanup like this and we we never could have done it without the help of the of the climbers and they also just had a great experience because this isn't generally how they spend their free time but they learned a lot about the importance of of keeping everything maintained of keeping right. our environment maintained i think that was a bicycle coming up look at all that trash oh, yeah. yeah you're right there it is right Amazing. there absolutely uncanny so here there is a 
the reward, so to speak. So what do we have? 1,200 1, pounds of trash in three hours. I think that's, that's phenomenal. That's, that's a really lot. That's really incredible. It's something that I would have never thought of, would never realized anything like that. Because, you know, I always picture beach, beach, beach. Well, right. there's a lot more to it because the rivers and streams flow right into the ocean and carry all this stuff basically to the ocean, which is what we're trying to prevent. Exactly. And that's where, by the rivers and by the creeks, that's where a lot of us live. And, and so, therefore, a lot of the trash ends up there, maybe more so than the beach. And the beach, there's more state park staff maybe there maintaining it and doing trash collection. There's not many people walking up and down the river trying to keep it clean. Well, we have a 30-second spot that I think, a, a, is it a young lady does this spot? Mm hmm Okay, so let's go to the beach and see what she says. Okay. Reusable water bottles, bags, cups, plates, and utensils are great alternatives to the disposable plastics that we use for a few minutes and then plague the ocean forever. For more ideas on how to pack a zero-waste picnic, visit SaveOurShores.org. That's very a little short thing. Now, so in place of what they normally would take, what did she have at the beach? Now? So, instead of having disposable things like styrofoam plates and cups and plastic water bottles, what did they have? They had something like this, a metal water bottle that they can carry. Actually, the water tastes better coming out of this than out of plastic. And they had plates from home. You notice they had the napkins, the fabric napkins That's as right. opposed. Yeah. So what does that mean? There's no trash that could be left behind. They're packing all that back up in their picnic basket and bringing that home with them and That's washing fantastic. it at home. So that's what Save Our Shores is really trying to do is we can't just keep cleaning up the trash. We've got to stop putting the trash out there in the first place. So getting people to use more reusable, more durable product, and getting away from this plastic one-use type of material. I think plastic is a convenience. It's something that uh, the world has come to realize that uh, we're buried in it now. Yes. And plastic is, is such a, a dangerous item, isn't it? It is, because it never goes away. And not only does it not ever go away, it can break into smaller pieces. And those are toxic pieces. I mean. Plastic is made out of chemicals, right? It's petroleum-based products. That's right. And our animals in the ocean don't know the difference between a, a plastic bag and a jellyfish and can easily eat that and, and Plastic bags, which is an, an interesting thing, I think. Uh, there is something, a stat that, that you talked about that's almost unbelievable. In the United States of America, not Canada or anywhere else, there's 100 billion plastic bags per year we have, and only 14% of those ever get to where they really need to be taken care of. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's not even 5% now of, of, oh of them that are recycled. So the, there's new reports that have come out, and really less than 5% of plastic bags are ever recycled. And when they are recycled, they have to be downcycled. So they're, they're being made into maybe some park benches or things like that. But they can't be recycled into another, re, you know, reusable bag. Yeah, that, they, you that can't sort of turn thing. them back into a bag again, right. a clean bag. Right. right. And what's probably nearly as bad are water bottles. Now, since we've been on the air, we did some computing here. That I understand that every five minutes in the United States, two million water bottles are used. So we have about five million water bottles have been used. In Ready just for in the time that we've just been since speaking. we started the program. Right. And that's the one that uh, only about 14% of those water bottles okay. are recycled. And so, again, where are all those other water bottles going? Are they going to the landfill? And if so, then they're just there forever. Yeah. Or do they find their way out into the ocean? We are picking up a lot of plastic bottles in our cleanups. So I think the ratio of that is like a one out of two, it's 50 billion or something like that per year, which is just to say, this is one country. That's and right, and we're just looking at our numbers. So imagine it's a worldwide effort. And I know if, if I travel to South America and other countries, there's a lot of plastic water bottles, definitely. I don't know when it started, but I I, I thought this is wonderful when we first got the water bottles. It makes it so convenient, convenient and so forth. You very know? convenient. Not realizing the extent of what would be happening and, right. and where it would go from there. Exactly. What about a cleanup? When you do a cleanup. How many bags do you pick up or bottles do you pick up in a cleanup? Well, what's great is now we've had five years of collecting data. Ah. And that's really helped us figure out what are those items that we're picking up the most. We've collected 34,000 plastic bags. 
That's an awful lot of plastic in, bags. In, in what period of time? In the five in years, five we've years. collected 34,000. We've collected 46,000 pieces of styrofoam. Now those oh, oh, my God, that's another whole issue of styrofoam. <laughs> And, oh, the little one. old styrofoam cup, I just crush it, and that's the end of it. But it's not the end of it, is it? That's right. And maybe you don't even crush it. Maybe maybe you throw it away, and a bird picks it out of the trash can, and then it goes into a million pieces. And then our, our cleanup volunteers, are they could sit there for hours trying to just pick just up all pick the little pieces. these little pieces. pieces and so forth. It's probably the worst thing that we find on the beach because it is so difficult to clean up. What kind of volume are we dealing with here? Well, it's... Like I say, 46,000 pieces. They could be very tiny pieces. They could be those packing peanuts that we often see. Oh, the popcorn? Yes. Oh, my. What, what's the popcorn doing at the beach? How did it get there? <laughs> you wonder. You wonder how these things get there. But sometimes it would flow down from the street. You know, it, it could flow down a storm drain. It could somehow get out onto the beach. But they seem to be everywhere. I just saw a whole bunch of them today. And, and you wonder, why are those getting there? One of the things you take to the beach is this nice, convenient, lightweight, uh, what are they called? Cooler, chest? Or yeah, or nice a cooler chest. chest. And, of course, once the top gets damaged, then it's time to leave it somewhere. Exactly. Well, we've found more of those than ever on our July 4th holidays. So up by the trash cans, you'll see these half-beaten up uh, styrofoam coolers. And, of course, the birds just love to go after that because they think there's still food in there. And then they're broken up into a lot of different pieces. They're not really a multi-use cooler. But there is a nice option. There are reusable bags that are lined inside as a cooler, and they're only about $6. You can pick them up at Costco, as opposed to maybe $5 for this styrofoam ice chest. So there are alternatives okay, that people so could be uh, using. Uh, that's something I'd like to talk about. Let's, let's get some more alter or alternatives to the plastic bag. Now, you said one thing. Well, we're moving in toward the stores, as you know. That's right. And I think eventually, will they disappear? Will the plastic bags disappear? I sure hope so. And I, and I'm, I know we're well on our way. So we have the uh, city of San Jose has enacted their ban on plastic bags. They've done a great job with outreach. They have the buses in the city that actually have the messaging on the side of them. So that, and they're being very diligent at, at all of the stores that people have visited. You know, we don't have plastic bags anymore. I hope you brought your own bag. City of Santa Cruz, or I'm sorry, the County of Santa Cruz, their ban is going into effect in three weeks. So we're really excited about that. Oh, it's almost that. here. Mm -hmm. It's almost here. It's been two and a half years, though, since Save Our Shores started working with the county to make this happen. So it's not an overnight process. And that's why when you say, will we see the end of this, maybe not in our lifetimes. Oh, my. But oh, that, I, that's scary. But Save Our Shores will just keep working harder and harder to get these cities to, to follow the lead of some of those first now, cities. I was just going to say, there must be some process here. Number one, the manufacturer said, I have to leave that business because it's getting smaller and smaller. That's one. Right. Two, uh, legislation ultimately right. is what stops it. Legislation is made by whom? Well, we can do it locally because the state of California tried to do this two years ago, and it failed. We tried to have a statewide ban, which would have been easier for, say, the grocery stores because if you have a Safeway in one town and then in another, You'd rather just have it uniform that, hey, we don't use plastic bags in any of these stores. But it did fail. And so what we've been forced to do is do it on a local level. So we're working with the counties. We're working with city councils. And we are making it happen, hoping we can build enough support. We have about 21 jurisdictions now that have bans. And hopefully keep building that number and put the pressure on the state. How about Southern California? Are they un involved in this? Yes, but there is a ban that was tried. It was put, being put in place in Los Angeles County. And they got sued. They're getting sued by, the, we believe, the manufacturers of these plastic bags who certainly don't want to see themselves put out of business. Well, you know, but ultimately people have to go into other businesses. Yes, and there are alternatives. There would be. What I'd like to do now is say, Laura Casa, Executive Director of Save Our Shores, is our guest this evening. Laura, uh, with other states, have you been involved in that or know something about it related to this? About the plastic bags? Mm -hmm. There are some other states that have done it. Generally, it's just towns, though. There isn't one state that has There's no central it. authority, then. Right. And California would have been the first one if we could have done it a year and a half ago or so. So we're still pushing. We haven't given up on that yet. But I think Save Our Shores has been more successful on the local level of making that happen. How about internationally? So, yes, places like India and China 
and Ireland put a tax on plastic bags, and it dropped by 94%. Oh, wow. Well, then let's just tax the bags. We can't. There's a law against it. I knew you were going to say <laughs> that. We would do that, but the plastic bag industry lobbied for a law several years ago that said we're not going to allow any tax on plastic bags. So it has forced us Turn. to ban them outright. No, there's no way around that. We didn't have an alternative, so that's why we went that way. One of the, the great areas that you have worked with is not, not just only the environment, but education. Mm -hmm. Educating the young people, get them out there picking up the garbage. They won't do it at home, but maybe they'll do it for you, Laura. <laughs> and they have. I just spoke with a group of uh, fourth graders the other day, and they actually go around and clean up their own campus. And it was interesting. They were amazed at what, at what they found. And then they go home and they tell their parents, and they talk to them about bringing oh. reusable bags to the store, and they seem very diligent about it. I've, I have a lot of hope for the next generation. That, uh, and that's where it is. I believe so. You know, absolutely. We've got our habits, right? Like you say, we've got our habits of sort of growing up with plastic bags, but you know, a few generations ago, they didn't have plastic bags. Right. One, one area that I know is a major concern, cigarettes. That's our number one item that we pick That's up. That's number one. In every cleanup that we've ever done, we've always picked up more cigarette butts than anything else. 290,000 cigarette butts in five years. 290,000. So the worst part of the cigarette is the filter. You got it, because that's made out of plastic. So that The rest of it actually away. disintegrates, but mm -hmm. not the filter. Right. And I think most people don't know that. I think most people think, oh, I can just like my cigarette butt, it'll disintegrate. Because it's just it's a little paper. piece of the cigarette, right? Right. But those cigarette butts end up down the storm drain, out into the ocean, and it's been proven that they will kill fish in a, in a matter of an hour or so if it's in a small enough area. With the carcinogen effect? Sure, because there's thousands of toxins in that filter. The filter's done such a great job of preventing those toxins yeah, from it, getting it's, inside It's going to stop me from getting cancer, but... Right, but the fish are another story. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's actually frightening. Now, have you worked with the, like animal preservation and so forth? Well, we're very concerned about that. And, and really, that's ultimately what we're trying to do is protect this ecosystem that exists in our sanctuary. And we see one of the biggest threats is this plastic that's floating in the ocean. It's, it can entangle animals. We have several pictures of animals that have, you know, maybe a plastic bag tied oh, around awful, them or yeah. just plastic pieces that are not helping them to really move around and therefore make it more difficult for them to swim and to eat. So that's really our goal is to try to preserve these animals. Many of them are endangered, so they don't need any more trouble. Well, that's, well, that's true. Uh, what I'd like to get to is a, a, a tragedy that happened a year ago in Japan. And I think this is a, a very dramatic thing where we're going to be receiving hundreds of tons of debris. Mm -hmm. So we have some slides that we're going to bring up related to that. And here we, here's the first one, Laura. Tell us about it. Sure. So what this is showing basically are the way the ocean currents work. And so we're looking right here at the Pacific Ocean and you can see our western coast of North America there. So it's basically giving us an idea how the trash might travel from Japan over towards the west coast of North America. And then we'll be looking at the next slide which will show us really w how that's being tracked. This is a model that NOAA has come up with. The different colors are representing the different years that it will take the trash to travel. So those red lines are the first year, so, so pretty much right now where we are. And then as we move into the orange and the yellow, that's probably when it's going to hit our coast. Okay, so what happens, and, but there's no real time thing, although it's been a full year, and I understand it's just arriving at midway now. Right, Which right, means right. it's probably headed for Alaska or, or it Canada. It could head further north than, than where we are. That's so then correct. it makes a swing, mm -hmm. and whatever we don't get, we send back to Japan. Well, Good yeah, riddance. I guess, I guess you could put it that way, yeah. Um, there definitely could be some that hits our shores and others that will stay a little bit offshore, and then we'll wind up in the current heading back towards Japan. Well, here's an opportunity for some. Well, what's this one now? This is basically the University of Hawaii's um, trajectory, which is showing the same information. So again, Right, as you said, in 2012, we'll see sort of this area of where the trash could possibly be getting out towards Midway. And then by possibly 2013, 
coming out and approaching our coast. Maybe it is going to be up towards Alaska or Washington, Oregon. And then really by 2014 is, is when they're predicting we'll see the most of it. And then again, it will head back around towards Japan after that. We're not sure exactly the years. It's going to be hard to tell because, like you are saying, this was a tragedy that happened. This hasn't really happened on this scale before. So we're really learning and, and watching to see what's going to happen. Now, I, th I think something about this whole thing is uh, uh, that the people that study currents are learning a lot by this movement of this mass. Absolutely. So this is a, you know, it's not a, a positive thing, but you get what you can out of it. Right. Because this may, I hate to say this, may not be the last time something like, like this, this happens. Like this happens. That's true. And, you know. so, and, it's, and they're trying to figure out how much of the trash really will arrive on our shores. A lot of it sank as soon as it got on. Well, automobiles or whatever. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to find houses floating across the Pacific Ocean. So nobody should run out there and try to get some oceanfront property when, when this mm -hmm. trash lands here. But what may happen is some of that debris may come a lot sooner than others, depending on the winds, depending on the type of material that it is. So all of that's uncertain, and we're looking to, to really understand how the currents work mm -hmm. once that trash arrives. Well, how many volunteers do you have on your, on your rolls? We are fortunate enough to have 10,000 volunteers 10, a year. 10,000 a year? Because we're a very small organization. We're only five people. We couldn't do 270 cleanups a year without the help of our volunteers. And that's, that's what makes it happen. And we can always use more volunteers, for oh, sure. Oh, I'm sure you can. That, 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 uh, that's definite. Well, th there's so much more to cover. And uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll have you back again at some point in time. I'd love to. It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure there's many things in 34 years that uh, we could dig deeper <laughs> on and find out one thing leads to another. We sure could. Thank you very much. Thank you. My guest has been, don't tell me, Laura Casa <laughs> from Save Our Shores. And we'll save your shores if you'll save ours. I'm not sure what that means. Hey, but let's just all save the shores. We'll be okay, in much Laura. better shape. Great. <laughs>